you want to be an entrepreneur, just do it. Dive headfirst into it. Uh, don't worry about breaking your skull. It'll probably happen anyway. This is that there's no other way. I, I say just do it, but make sure two things. You have enough money in the bank to go for a year because it's not going to happen overnight. And you make sure you have an idea you can fund. You can get to the point where you can show that there is demand for your product, like that extreme demand. If you can't show that to investors, it's really tough to raise money. If you can, it's really easy. On this episode of Establishing Your Empire, I host Steve Hoffman. Steve is the CEO of Founderspace, which is one of the world's leading startup accelerators with over 50 partners in 22 countries. Founderspace was ranked number one incubator for overseas startups by Forbes and Entrepreneur Magazines. Hoffman is also a venture investor, founder of five startups and author of several award-winning books. These include Make Elephants Fly, Surviving a Startup, and The Five Forces. While in Hollywood, Hoffman went on to pioneer interactive television by producing TV shows with NBC, MTV, History Channel, and others. In Silicon Valley, Hoffman's startups were in the areas of games and entertainment and worked on such hit mobile games as Tetris, Will of Fortune, Tomb Raider, Hitman, and X-Files. Hoffman has also trained hundreds of startup founders and corporate executives in the art of innovation. If you're thinking about launching a product or company, you must listen to this episode. It'll give you so many ways to overcome the odds, raise capital, and build a thriving, profitable business. You're listening to the Establishing Your Empire show, a podcast that inspires entrepreneurs, creatives, and future business owners to pursue their passions, grow their organizations, and build their empire. My name is Darren Herman, and creatively, I'm best known for my photography, but business-wise, my claim to fame is growing a company from 15K per month in online sales to breaking the $1 million a month barrier. And I'm sitting down with interesting people to talk about their process, the lessons they've learned, and how they have established their empires. Okay, I got Steve Hoffman, aka Captain Hoff, here on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. Thank you so much for uh, joining me today. It is fantastic to be here. Real excited for our, our chat today. I think we're going to go to a lot of different directions, startup world, AI world, talking about the metaverse, books, being an author, all that stuff. When you describe who Steve Hoffman is, what do you usually say? So I am the chairman and CEO of Founderspace which is a global startup incubator and accelerator. We work all over the world with entrepreneurs. And I'm also an author. So I've authored three different books. Um, my first book, Make Elephants Fly, which is all about the process of radical innovation. My book that just came out this year, Surviving a Startup, Everything Entrepreneurs Need to Know to Survive. And I have a second book out this year, The Five Forces That Change Everything, which is about the metaverse, technology, artificial intelligence, the future, brain-computer interfaces, all that cool stuff. Yeah, let's jump right into that because I think that's such a hot topic with Facebook changing their name to Meta. To me, it seems like almost a race to the next operating system, the next Windows, how you see the metaverse in the future or wherever you want to take it. Yeah. So. The metaverse has been around a while. We've had virtual worlds. We've had many attempts at augmented reality, Google Glass and others, Magic Leap. Now, we all, it goes all the way back to Second Life and before with these virtual worlds. But what we're seeing now is Facebook changed its name. So it got a new boost of adrenaline into this, you know, into this whole metaverse thing. Facebook changed its name for a number of reasons. So Number one, it did acquire Oculus. So it's been playing in this space. It, Mark Zuckerberg truly believes that there's something beyond the web as we know it. And he's calling this the metaverse. And he, this is where people will be hanging out, spending their time in the future. Facebook also did it in a timely manner, changing their name because they were under a lot of pressure from the outside due to all their screw ups and misbehavior. So there are many reasons. But what we've been seeing is virtual reality has been evolving for quite some time. There's been a number of false starts where a lot of venture capital rolled into virtual reality. This probably happened half a dozen times and everybody says, it's coming, it's the next big thing. And then it doesn't, just doesn't quite materialize. 
What we've seen in the past with technologies is there are always false starts. There are false starts to the smartphone. Apple had the Newton. Then there was there were many other smartphones out there before the iPhone changed everything. The same is going to happen with virtual mixed reality and the metaverse. We are at a certain point, the technology is going to be there. The whole ecosystem is going to be there and it's just going to explode. Now, if you ask me, when is this going to happen? There are a number of different factors that are going to come into play. So first of all, the technology, I think the base requirement is the technology has to be as easy to use as your smartphone. Now, this is really important because you have a choice as the consumer of these technologies. Am I going to put on this headset or wear these special glasses or put in these contact lenses or whatever it takes to enter the metaverse? Or am I just going to access it or am I just going to use the current device I have, the smartphone? So in most cases, what we've seen is people use their smartphone. Like they, nobody wants to you, you wear these Google Glass or other things coming out. Apple's coming out with a new one. We will see. The other thing is, if it's not going to be as simple as a phone, which is pretty hard to beat, like smartphones are pretty brain dead simple now and we've all learned them. So we know their, their interface. If it's not going to be that simple, it needs to add a value that is so much more compelling, like not just incrementally better than what you do or just different. It needs to be like, oh my God, I have to use this. If there's, either there's no other way to do what I want to do except using this new device, whether it's an augmented reality glass, a virtual reality headset, or it can enable me to do different things that I wouldn't normally do and experience. And those things are not just fun. They can be fun and entertaining, but they're also have a utility value. They're, re they're useful. I can get things done. So we're seeing most of the action in the metaverse today is simply through, honestly, your, your personal computer. Like people are on their PCs and they are engaging in things and virtual worlds that are out there and these kind of games that are really world-like games. And the biggest one lately is Decentralized Land, which is a virtual reality world on the blockchain. Now, why has this gained so much attention and action recently? Because they... You can go in there and buy and sell NFTs and virtual goods. People are actually speculating, buying up land. And I read about people doing this a year ago, like it's been around for a while and they were buying this land really cheap. And now they're selling it for astronomical sums of money, six and seven figures. It's absolutely crazy. So whenever you have uh, this sort of, it's in a way it's a game. It's the gamification of investing. That's what we've seen with cryptocurrency and even meme stocks. It's all, this is just a game. What is it really worth? We don't really care. As long as somebody else is going to play that game, the community is strong enough and it's going to drive up prices. And I think I can get in early at, or even get in later and sell to somebody for more. So we're seeing this happen across Axis Infinity is another one, another of these uh, virtual world metaverse on the blockchain where people are buying and selling land and other things. So we are going, this area is very hot, but uh, to have staying power, I can't just be a marketplace that people bid up and up because at a certain point, you're going to reach the top of what people want to spend on these, these virtual goods. And where do you go from there? <laughs> Only places down. And if, if people, it's going down, people aren't going to be as excited as when it's going up. So the engagement is going to fall. So what we need uh, are places where people really want to spend their time, either for entertainment purposes, socialization, or actually getting stuff done. And that's where we are with the metaverse. I had Rish Latlakar on the podcast about a year ago. So I own some virtual land here at Zilker Park here in Austin, Texas on the Superworld app, just another kind of area. Because at that point, Ethereum was pretty inexpensive, but now I'm like, man, actually that land is worth some money just because Ethereum went up uh, in price. What, what can I do to prepare? What, how can I get ahead of the, the game to put myself in a good position for this metaverse if it takes off? Let's just pretend it's gonna take off in a couple of years. Like, what can I do now? To, I don't know, be prepared and, and make money or just anything, right? Yeah. So. Well, Mark Zuckerberg asked himself the same question, and he has a lot of money. So he can afford to hire, quote unquote, 10,000 engineers to work on this. So he's prepared. He, he doesn't want to miss out. 
Now, the one thing that's interesting about this metaverse for companies, uh, like big companies, especially like Facebook style, Google style, is if it's on the blockchain, a lot of it isn't owned by anybody, so they can't acquire it. And if you look at Facebook's strategy in the past, they were prepared for new markets by buying their way in. Literally, Facebook launched dozens of their own apps. I don't know any one of their apps that succeeded, but they bought WhatsApp. They bought Instagram, which seemed like a lot of money that they spent on them, but it turned out to be an incredible. Zuckerberg knows that he might not be able to buy his way into this blockchain powered world because uh, these are foundations. They're owned by the community. Uh, it's not something a big corporation can take over. In that case, he has to build it. So he's bought, he's hiring a lot of engineers. If you're an entrepreneur out there and you uh, have the resources in your company, you can put people on this and you don't have to put 10,000 people on it because most people can't afford 10,000 employees, but you could uh, put one person on it. So I tell CEOs of companies, I, I work with huge companies, giant like Qualcomm's of the world and young entrepreneurs who have nothing or bootstrapping it literally. And I tell them, first of all, if you're a company where you actually can afford to have employees, you don't have to have like super expensive employees on this. You don't have to have a lot of employees. What you have to hire is the right people. You don't have time as a CEO of your company to do all this, like to get on all these virtual worlds, to get, figure out all these new devices. Like it could take up your whole day every day and you would get no business done because you're spending all this time on this stuff. But you can hire a young person out of college and what you want to hire is somebody who's naturally curious, somebody who's, oh my God, I love this stuff. I love playing with, you're actually paying them to do what they love, like figure out new stuff and figure out how we as a business can participate in this. So how will this affect our business? If we could be a first mover in this space, if it, if you can figure out a strategy where this aligns with our business and we can be a first mover in the space and actually ahead of our competitors can give us a huge competitive advantage. So that's one thing, very important. If you're an individual and you want to, like you did, you bought some land and fortunately it went up because Ethereum went up, whether the land didn't go, went up at all, you got lucky there. But you can allocate a certain amount of time to exploring these new things. And I recommend everybody do this. Nobody should be totally in the dark. You can't do everything. So what you need to do is pick the ones that first of all, excite you, that you think have potential, and also pick the ones that are moving things that have momentum. Look for where the action is. If there's a lot of action somewhere, something's going to come out of it. There's so much action in the blockchain. We saw early on so much innovation going on and decentralizing things that you, you knew something was going to come out of this. You didn't know what, and you didn't know which one would be big, but you knew that, but actually putting some time in there and figuring it out will pay off in the future. So that's my advice. Uh, to all of you out there. So let's go back. I think one thing that we have in common is, I think your quote that you put on your kind of bio is that you've had more careers than uh, cats have lives. So what, why don't we just talk about your story? How did this whole career get going? So I have done a lot of different things. As I said in my bio, I'm, when I was young, I wanted to be a filmmaker. So I wanted to make movies. I made 50 films from grade school through high school. I was just totally into it. And my father though, he was literally an MIT rocket scientist. And he said, son, computers are the future. Study computers. So I listened to my father. I went into electrical computer engineering, got a degree in that. But after I got my degree, I was like, this isn't exactly what I want to do. I want to do something on the more creative side. So I went, applied to two graduate schools in film and television, USC, and NYU, those are the top ones. I got into one of them, I got into USC, and I ran with it. So I got my master's in, in film and television production. Then I went to work in Hollywood. I worked my way up to a television development executive. And when I was in this role, it was really amazing because I got to learn the business, but it wasn't exactly uh, what I wanted to do. I wanted to really create something. And I was more in a management executive role. And I was still young. So I heard one of the producers in the company, his cousin was actually the founder of Sega, the video game company. And they had just surpassed Nintendo to be the, become the number one video game company in the world. So I went and met the chairman and I signed me up. I think games are going to be much bigger than film and television, which was at that time, 
It was a while ago. Nobody believed. A few people believed it, but not a lot. And he said, sure, we want somebody from Hollywood. And he sent me over to Japan to work in their headquarters, coming up with new ideas. So it was a fantastic experience. I got to combine my technical side with my creative side. We had this big project called AS1, where, where we, it was an amusement ride. And we had actually Michael Jackson came to our office. He was starring in it. We had him in it. It was a really fun experience. I did that. And then I got the itch. I said, I want to start my own game company. I don't want to work for this Japanese company. I want to do it myself. So I moved back to my home, which is the San Francisco Bay Area. And I launched my first, I just bootstrapped it. So I've done literally three venture funded startups in Silicon Valley and two bootstrap startups. My first one was bootstrap. It was a labor of love. I was creating a game, which is ironically what I do today. So I teach entrepreneurs around the world how to run their business. And the game that I first started with that I wanted to make was a game that teaches entrepreneurship. And it was called Gazillionaire. So it's how to become a gazillionaire. And I literally bootstrapped the whole thing. I, I did all the coding myself. I did the drawings of the artwork and I had artists bring it to life. And this game was really funky, really weird, an out there entrepreneurial game. And there was no, the internet was nascent at this time, very beginning of the internet. So what did I do? I upload this game to BBSs. These were bulletin boards. They were pre-internet. And that's where all the geeks hung out. And the geeks would yeah. download shareware. Mm -hmm. So you remember, th my first sale came in the mail because you couldn't do e-commerce. Somebody sent me the cash in the mail, $15, from none other, and you'll be surprised, none other than Lord Geck. Lord Geck, the Lord Geck. So he was just a geek, right? <laughs> he was a geek. Who else would buy your game off a bulletin board but somebody named sure. Lord Geck? And right. he lived in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I had him over my house for dinner and I got to meet Lord. And he looked just, you would imagine, this goatee, chubby guy, nerdy. And he bought my first game and I was pretty happy. So we're uh, selling games over the internet and way before e-commerce, way before Amazon. And then the largest PC gaming company in the world at the time, Spectrum Holobyte Microprose, mm -hmm. their QA team, which is their quality assurance team, had downloaded the game and were hooked on it. They loved it. So it rose all the word rose all the way up the ranks to the president of the company. The president calls me and says, we want to get your game out by Christmas. And I like was like, awesome. It'll go everywhere. And this time retail was big for games. So it'd go into every store in the country. And I was super excited. And when I was negotiating with them, and this is a lesson for all you entrepreneurs out there, I began to get the feeling they really needed this game. And I was like, why do they need this little game created by this developer? Yeah, it's fun, but it's, it's not like the latest high tech game. Like I coded it and I wasn't a master coder, but it was funky and fun. And, but it turned out that I heard that their Star Trek franchise, which they had spent millions of dollars on, was delayed and couldn't make it for the Christmas window. So they needed to book revenue because they were a public company. So they needed some product to put on the shelves because as soon as you ship, you can book the revenue. And so they could hit their numbers. So they were literally had to have this game. And as soon as I figured that out, I said, I have negotiating power here. Like I'm not just this little developer working out of my home. So I literally demanded they give me all the rights. Like they would have... I got all sequel rights, which was pretty unheard of at the time. I got all because you needed publishers then. It wasn't like today. If you were going to get it on retail, you couldn't do it yourself. So I was just like, so basically I, I retained all the rights, put this game out there. Turned out it was a big hit. Gazillionaire did really well. That was my first step into entrepreneurship. And ironically, again, Gazillion are still available today. So it's on Steam for any of you gamers out oh, there. Oh, wow. I'll, I'll have to check it out. So I have a bunch of questions. And so first off, you have this great job, right? You're in Japan with Sega. How did you actually leave to start your own thing? Did you work on the side for a little bit? Did, you know, I think a lot of people have this trouble. And I even had this a little bit for a minute is you have this comfortable place and you, but you have these aspirations for something else. How did you actually jump off that cliff or move forward? So I'm a bit crazy. So my first job in the film industry, nobody would have left that job. 
my boss thought I was nuts. He was like, Hoffman, what are you doing leaving this job? <laughs> you know, going to Japan to make games? That's crazy. That was my boss <laughs> in the film industry. He thought I was nuts, but I just left. I just did it. In this job in Japan, I'd saved up a little money working these jobs. And I was like, I just have to do this. So I was, I just jumped both. I just jumped. I just moved back with what money I had, set up my company, kept it something I could afford to do, which is something I tell entrepreneurs. Like you can have big dreams, but look at your pocketbook. Like you got to make this work, right? And don't expect anybody to give you money because uh, for Gazillionaire, I went out to publishers to get an uh, advance and funding from big publishers because it's coming out of Sega. I couldn't get the money. They wouldn't fund it. Like nobody would give me money. So I had to fund it myself. And you just have to be prepared to do that. So. I just have done that throughout my career. Just every time I get, I see an opportunity or I get antsy, I just, I figure things will work out. Somehow things will work out. And then I think another big piece of that story there is you learned that you had the leverage, right? And then you actually used it. And I always try to help. I have friends that I'll help like through the negotiation process of getting a job and they get really uncomfortable talking about the money and all this. Any tips or tricks to when you, let's just say you already know you have the leverage, like you found that out, which is very, can be a very difficult process. Any tips or tricks to use that to your advantage? Yes, you have to be really careful. I ended up driving that president crazy. Like he was going nuts because of all the terms. He was like, what are you asking for? Like, and by the end, he was just, he was, he ended up signing it, but he was driven a little nuts. But I had a lot of leverage in that case. In most cases, you do not have that much leverage. And so let me tell you, it's rare that you have that much leverage, and especially when dealing with a much more powerful partner who has all the cards. So there were other big game companies at the time who wanted to pick up our next. So one uh, the other big players at the time were Broderbund and Sierra Online. They were huge, other, the other two huge players. I entered into negotiations with them for the sequels. We released a bunch of these business games. And I'll tell you, with Broderbund, pissed them off. They just dropped us. Like they literally, we asked, see, because we got spoiled. Like we, I, I figured, oh, I could get all this from the, this other huge game company. I can ask for it again. Literally, they wouldn't take it. So really important. My partner was actually doing the negotiation and tone of voice is really important. So when you ask for what you want to ask for, you have to make sure to do it in as friendly and non pushy way as possible. So if you're going to ask for a lot, make sure to do it in a nice way because people are people. Emotions matter. And the woman at Broderbund, she just got turned off and she says, oh, you're too much trouble. Like you're just too much trouble. And literally we couldn't, we thought she would come back to the table. She never came back. So if you ask for too much in the wrong way, it was a real lesson learned. You won't get it. Sierra Online was a different case. They asked for too much. They were literally, they wouldn't give us, we always, when we negotiate, we want gross revenue, like a percentage of gross, not a percentage of net. Because at the end of the day, who knows what their expenses are? <laughs> yeah, they can just say whatever. They can hide a lot of- Don't worry, it's net revenue. And we're like, no, this is a deal breaker. Like you either give us, you give us a uh, gross or we're, we're walking and we walked in that case. But in both those cases, we didn't get what we wanted for different reasons. But negotiations are tough. You, you have to, I always say, put a lot of time into the people, making the people feel good, go out to lunch with them, spend time with them, and then you can ask for stuff. And if they like you, they may not give it to you, but it won't tank the negotiation. I love it. So what happened next? So, so you have this gazillionaire hit. What did you do after that? So we followed up with another game called Zapitalism, which is capitalism with a Z, and then another game called Profitania. And these were all fantasy business simulation games. We made our name there. And after that, my friend from film school, my best friend from film school, we got together and she had just launched a massively multiplayer online game for Microsoft. And it was one of the first massively multiplayer online games. So the technology was like brand new. And this is a thing when there's new technology, there's new opportunities. And fortunately, we live in a world today that where there's more new technologies than people know what to do with. So there's always more new opportunities for entrepreneurs. So this, we got together, there are four of us. One of them was the engineer who had built out the platform and owned the IP. And we decided we were going to launch a company. 
We didn't know what it would be. We knew we had this technology, but we didn't know what our business was, which is usually not the way I recommend you start. Because if you have great technology, but you don't know what you're going to do with it, it's much easier to build technology than it is to find a product market fit. So we were, we began on this path, which is really a great way for entrepreneurs to learn. And I write about all these tips that I give you on negotiation and stuff in my book, Surviving a Startup. So a lot of this is in there in more detail, but I'll go through it quickly. Number one, I decided if we should build a platform, not a product, a platform, because in a platform, you can literally, we've seen, bring on lots of partners. So I wanted to bring on all these and they create value for you. So I wanted to bring on all these game developers and they would use our massively multiplayer engine to literally launch their games, massively multiplayer. It seemed like a great idea. I think it was a great idea, but we were too early. Like the market wasn't there for massively multiplayer games. So the game developers like, I can just make a single player game. That's fine. They didn't need it. They didn't absolutely need it. And the ones who wanted to do it were only willing to give us a small amount of their revenue share. And they wanted a lot of customization. So it was broken. Like I figured this out in the first couple months, broken. Number two, my partner was pushing for us to just launch our own casual game because we didn't have the resources to do a really in-depth game. So we came up with this idea called Jabber Chat. And, Jab and at this time, JavaScript had just come out and people were able to embed these widgets into websites. And one of the popular widgets was chat. So we decided to make chat, uh, our own chat bot with chat-based games, like you could play while you're chatting. And they were really fun. And we developed all these games, put them out there. We caught hundreds of websites to embed them in their website. So hundreds of websites, put them out there. We were like huge, like overnight. And then we were like, but we need money because I didn't know any venture capitalists. Like now I'm an investor, but at that time there were no incubators to speak of in Silicon Valley. It was really the early days. And I was like, we need money. We can't go forever doing this. Like we have to get cash flow. So we figured out that there was this company out there that was actually embedding advertising into online applications and websites. And we're like, totally new idea. That's great. We're like, advertising is going to power the internet. This is awesome. And this company no longer exists today. But they were one of the early movers. We took uh, their ads, put them in our game. And literally we thought, okay, with all these websites, we're going to get a huge check at the end of the month. So we're waiting. And literally at, during the same time period, we won South by Southwest, the big contest, the top interactive game. Yeah. So we were like on top of the world. A lot of attention was on us. We get our check and the check was for $13.60. What? We're like, ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. And we're like, and we, we're like, this is, we can't even go and buy a pizza for the team. This is not a lot of money. And you know, we were too early. Advertising didn't exist. Nobody was buying these ads. That's the bottom line. Nobody bought ads at that time. You could still put out ads, but they were buying them for like nothing. So we had to pivot again. And at this point, we're like, oh my God, we got to figure something out. It's been months and months and we work like crazy and we don't have a business. We have cool like, products and technology, but we don't have a business. So we heard through the, the grapevine that MTV was thinking of launching their first interactive TV show, which would synchronize a show on the web with a live TV broadcast. So literally, like it would be a frame accurate synchronization of a game show they were launching called Web Riot with the online portion, and they didn't have somebody to build it. So what did we do being entrepreneurs? We had this massively multi-user game engine. We got on the phone and we started leaving voicemail messages for the senior vice president of MTV. Please, we are spider dance. We are this company. We have what you need. And guess what happened? Uh, that sounds like they called you back. They never called us back. <laughs> oh my God. I thought that was the buildup. That, no, that was a bad buildup. No. <laughs> But, but my friend, my, my partner, she got invited to speak at CES from her previous job before she started. So she kept that speaking engagement and she went there and she at, was on a panel and she started talking about our dream of building interactive television and our platform and all, even though we hadn't done it, we just had this technology, but we hadn't even implemented it. She's talked about after the talk, somebody comes running up from the audience, pushes through everybody, comes up to her and says, I have to talk to you. You have exactly what we need. 
I am the senior vice president of MTV. <laughs> and she looks at him and she goes, yeah, we've been leaving voicemail messages for you all month. <laughs> <laughs> so, so check there, your voicemail so there you go we had a deal signed in a few weeks we had three hundred fifty thousand dollars in the bank which was a lot to us as a bootstrap company and we were on our way so i think a lot of startups have this and they have this gold star that they go to and then they keep working even though that sometimes it's not working and I'm sure you've seen a lot of this advice, tips, tricks, anything you want to go with it with how to pivot and keep the spirit and morale up, right? So our spirit and morale was up because we had no choice. <laughs> it was like do or die. Like when you commit to something, you're doing it or you're dying with it. So we were not going to stop. Now, one of the things I have a rule, like people said, when should I quit an idea and start a new one? Like when? And I have a very simple answer to this. And most people, I say most startups fail because not because they try too many ideas, but because they stick with the same idea too long. And it's, it, it, it isn't working or it's partially working, but not quite there. And they think if I just stick with this, and I've had this with products because I've launched a lot of products in my lifetime. And some of them, I was just like, I just add one more feature. I just change this one thing. I just do this and everything will work. Or I just get more money for marketing and drive in more traffic and it'll work. Never does. If that core isn't working, you can put as much lipstick on that pig as you want, as much icing on that cake as you can slather. It's still either it's still going to be a pig or a bad cake. Like it's not going to taste good at the end of the day. Adding more features never solves a problem. So number one, look at your numbers. Look at the facts. Number one, if it's an online application, an app or something like that, are users engaging? Are they going deeply? And then number two, is there a way to monetize them? If the, the, we, for the second one with Jabber Chat that we did, there was no way to monetize people. Maybe if we'd stuck with it a lot longer and had venture capital to ride it out for years, when the ad market came in, we could have done quite well with that. But in our position, we just couldn't justify doing that. So th that's when to pivot. Number two, is if you're selling to customers, like we are selling to the game developers, you can't educate somebody into buying your product. I've had this happen many times in my career, and I work with hundreds of entrepreneurs. If you have to educate the person on why they need your product, forget it. You've already lost. Like when you show somebody something, like we showed them our massively multiple user game engine, if they're not, if they're like, oh, that's pretty nice, which a lot of them said, that's pretty nice, you have no business. Nobody buys a nice to have product. They're like, that's pretty nice, but they're not going to pay you a lot of money. And if you do it, they're going to demand a lot. And it's going to be a really tough slog. What you want, what we needed to hear to go forward with that. And this is a lesson that I learned and I later forgot in life. <laughs> Made the same mistake <laughs> again. But what we, what you have to hear is not, oh, that's pretty good. That's nice to have, blah, blah, blah. What you need to hear is, oh my God, I need that now. I need that. I, I want that. I want that. Let, how can I get it? How, you just tell me. If you don't get that type of reaction, you have no business selling to somebody. That, if that's your customer, forget it and move on. So really, it's, that's the core. That's what you need to know. So with the multiple pivots with that one, and plus all the different things you've done, what's, what's some good ways to vet your ideas? Because I'm sure when you had those two pivots, you probably had a lot of other ideas too, as well as other things you've done. So any ways to you know identify good ideas and vet them? And you gave a little bit there too already, but... Any, any other ideas? So one way is never do what we did, which is have a technology in search of a market. That is tough because then you have this like amazing technology, but you're trying to figure out where people really need it. And that is always hard. It's better. Now, this is what I tell people to do. Don't uh, have as many ideas as you want. But, and I write about this in my book, the idea is not the most important thing. Like you think it is. You think it's everything. Like I tell people, the best entrepreneurs like in the world don't even start with an idea. Like they literally do not start with knowing exactly what they're going to do. And what they do instead is they get a great group of people together. They spend most of their time in the beginning figuring out who they want to work with, like amazing people, like an amazing technologist, an amazing user experience designer, amazing people like that. They bring them together. And then they pick an area they're really excited about. So it could be 
the DeFi space. It could be, I want to do something green, with green energy, uh, and we all have talents that we can put into there. Or I'm really passionate about making the fishing industry more sustainable. How do I do that? And what they do is they jump into the industry as an outsider. Because as an outsider, if take, the fishing industry is never going to change. Like they're decimating fish populations. They're polluting the ocean. They're, it's non-sustainable. It's going to burn out. But they keep doing things the same way. Like they are not changing. How are you going to get them to change? You could have a billion ideas in your head about what they should do. And I will tell you, they'll probably ignore them all. The only, unless you're going to make them money, unless you can increase the profits or whatever you could do. Exactly. So you have to go into that industry, like the fishing industry, and you, what you want to do is figure out a way that you could make sustainable fishing more profitable for them. That is, at the end, it's got to matter to them. And most people are short-sighted, unfortunately. So what you got to do is you got to engage with them. And you have a vision. Like, I'm not saying don't have a, a vision. You have a vision. I want to transform this industry, but I don't know exactly what technology we're going to use. I have a lot of different ideas. And then you start experimenting with them. You start going with them. What if we did this? What if we did that? What if, you know, you get some people in the industry who are friendly to you and you engage with them on a deep level. Would you, would you, and you look at their eyes, are their eyes, are they bored? Are they like pensive? Are they on it? Did you hit something that they really need? And it's something that aligns with, you. okay, how can we stop all this bycatch, this wasted bycatch? How can we prevent that and still make you guys more money? If you can do that, you have a business. And this is why I like to say entrepreneurs aren't people who just come up with ideas out of thin air. Look at Elon Musk. Did he come up with the idea for Tesla? No, <laughs> like that was somebody else's company. He was just an investor. Look at Kalanick and Uber. Did he come up with the idea for Uber? No, that was somebody else came up with that idea. But they are great at recognizing opportunity. Great entrepreneurs are great at identifying opportunities and executing on them. Like that. Is, so I say at the beginning stage of being an entrepreneur, you are not an idea generator. That's not what you are. You, you are a demand hunter. You are looking for what I call extreme pent up demand, these pockets of demand that are ready to explode, yet th you have to tap into them. And if you tap into that, you come up with, you find that demand, and then you come up with a solution to what they want. Boom, that'll drive your company. That'll create that exponential growth. Oh man, I love it. And, it, and I think that's so, such a different approach that a lot of people take is the market first almost. Go and talk to the market. Don't just start building, talk to the market first before. A lot of people just want to go into their offices and start working, right? Yeah. They, you get excited about your idea. You want to start building it, especially engineers love to do this. They don't want to go out and just talk to people. They want to make something and you can be successful. And the other way is if you were the customer, like if you recognize that there's something you really want, I'll give you the example of YouTube. And I write about this in Make Elephants Fly, my first book. So YouTube was trying to solve this problem. Like, uh, come up with a, an idea that worked. Their first attempt at YouTube was a video dating site. Video dating, like they thought that was the big thing. Seemed to make sense. Broadband was coming. People like to date. Why not? Lo and behold, video dating did not take off. And YouTube was dying. Like they were dying, but they had a problem. They had, they wanted to share a large video file with their friends. They had their own video that they took. They wanted to share it with their friends. And they were like, how do we do this? Oh, we made this video dating site uh, that allows people to upload their videos. Well, if we just uploaded our video and shared the link, all our friends could watch it and we don't have to do anything. They, the friends loved it. So they found out through that one simple thing that, my God, our business isn't video dating at all. Our business is allowing people to upload and share videos. That was their business and they pivoted. So if you are building something for yourself, you've discovered, ah, I need this product. And there are a lot of other people out there. That's a great way. That way you can start. So a lot of people build it first, but they're building it knowing uh, that they really need this and other people really need this. I love that. So um, I also want to talk about being an author. So I'm in the process of writing a book right now. I'm basically taking this podcast that I've had, these all these great guests and distilling down all their information of basically I want every page to be a nugget of information if possible. But I want to talk about like why how did you start your first book? Like how did that happen and 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 how did you get going? Ah, so my first book was on game design because that's the world I was in and it, it was well, Game Design Workshop got published by CMP, the company that runs 
I don't know if the game, big game design conference out there and all that stuff. So that I got started because my friends did it. Like my friends, my partner from my first company, a first venture funded company, Spider Dance, and another guy from that company, they were, they had started the book and got stalled. <laughs> and I happen to be somebody who just gets stuff done. Like I, like if a task is put in front of me, I would just plow through it. So they're like, Steve, we need you to join. We've done all this research. We've done all this stuff. They were teaching at that point at USC, the game design program. And they're like, we, we want you to come on board and help us just get this out the door. And so I jumped on board. It was really easy in the sense that they had done a ton of research. But I've written uh, since then three other books and uh, all of them picked up by major publishers. And it was really, it's a challenge. Like writing is, is I, the only way I can write honestly is if I make it my number one priority for a period of time, number one, like, and literally every day, everything else goes on hold until I, I, I write, you can't start doing, e I found that I have to start writing when I get up. I can't answer emails, can't get on Instagram, can't do all these other things because those will just suck up your energy, not just your time, but your focus and energy. If you and then you just have to jump right into it and get words down on the page. Get them down, write one page, write another page. Don't be too self-critical. You can always go back and change it. And when you get into the flow, my God, that's when, you know, when, those, when it just starts flowing, then you can just crank. And like the flow for me, in a, if I can get in the flow one day, pretty sure I can get in the flow the next day. Pretty sure I can get in the next day. And you want this series, like you're just every day in that flow. And you can get a book done, especially if you've done a lot of research in advance. If you know what you're writing about, you have your podcasts and all the material, you can do it pretty fast. One thing that it's very, that's very interesting of, of doing it right away, because what will happen is you get in the middle of the day, okay, okay, I've got most of my day with stuff I had to get done. Now I'm going to start writing. And they're like, maybe I should be doing this as well. And then you just float Slow. away. I, because for me, different people are different, but for me, I, I have a lot of inertia when I'm writing. I have to get over this inertia hump, like getting into that flow to me. Writing, it seems like it's natural to me, but it's actually quite painful. Like the only reason I get it done is brute forcing it. Like, like I literally brute force it and I have to break through every single day that inertia that kind of will stop me. And then once I'm going, like it's going and it feels great. But getting over the inertia is painful. So it's like super painful and then it's great. Uh, but if I stop in that super painful part, then it, that's the worst feeling. <laughs> you, you end up failing and then you have to go back the next day and you failed the previous day really hard. So you don't want to set yourself up for failure because the more times you fail to break that inertia, eventually, like I've tried to write, like I've written four books and put a ton of energy and time into them. But I've also attempted, I would say a dozen books that I never quite got that flow going. If you can't get it going, those books just never materialize. Yeah. And I lost a lot of, I was going really well. And then I, I, which is fantastic, but I just had, we had a baby boy about 12 weeks ago. <laughs> so that kind of killed some momentum, but also, and then, so now I'm like kicking it back up. And, and, but I'm struggling to kick it back up because a lot of that energy, that initial excitement is, is gone now. And luckily totally, I do have a, totally. a great, and I have a great base, but I'm saying yeah. when, when it languishes, it's really hard. That's why the concentrated effort way is the best way. You just say for the next two months, I'm going to get this damn book done. The first draft, but the, once you have the first draft done, then you can dawdle on the second draft for another eight months if you want, you know, but, but the first draft is, is the hard part. So talk to me about publishers. So you obviously went the publishing route as opposed to self-publishing. How did those pitches go? Anything that was helpful? Anything that was that seemed to work? Sure. For any of you out there thinking of writing a book, the, my first book, I got Make Elephants Fly. I went out there not knowing if I could get a publisher. I don't have deep connections or any connections with the publishing industry. But I went to agents first. And I literally, you have to write agents. And when you can research all of this online, so basically you write them a query letter. And then if they're interested, you have to follow up with an overview of your book. And it's very detailed what they expect in the overview of the book. So they want comparisons to other books. They want your social media numbers, all these things. They really care about all that stuff. So you really um, have to do it the right way. And I got an agent and then the agent sold it into Hachette, one of the large, the large publishers out there. 
And the second book, I switched agents, got a different, and she sold it into HarperCollins, did quite well there. Now, the real question is getting, is it worth all the work? Because it's a lot of work to get an agent. And then the agent has no guarantee that they're going to sell it into a publisher. There's no guarantee. Like you get an agent, you, if you don't have an agent, it's almost impossible to get a big publisher. So unless you're famous, like if you're famous, you could do anything. Like, but it, so is it worth the work? So honestly, big publishers don't do that much. Like they might give you some good advice on editing. They will actually put it out there in a good form with the biggest thing you gain from getting a big agent, and you have to ask yourself if this will matter to you, the biggest thing you gain is their name value. Like it gives you, it gives you a halo of the halo effect, right? You're with Harper Collins, you get that halo effect that translates more into respect than it does into direct sales. You're still going to have to sell your book and your book is going to have to sell itself because they don't have the money. There isn't the money in publishing for them to justify big marketing dollars. So at the end of the day, you're still, you're going to have to do the same work either way to make your book big. And my books did uh, quite well here in the U.S., but they did phenomenally well in Asia, in South Korea, in Taiwan, and especially in China. Like I, I saw that you had them translated. Yeah. And yeah. In China, I was like, wow, that's a, a big translation. That's not just going from English to German or something. That's big time. No, they became a huge hit in China like in all of these countries, but in China, especially I'm super famous, like much more famous than I am here in the U S I'm really well known because of my books and because we opened our founder space incubators in China too. But all of, but I will tell you, if you don't have a big name publisher in the U S you're not going to get overseas deals like that. Like I got the top publisher for business books in China because I had had Shet at first and then Harper Collins, those names give you the, because they don't know, like they don't know if your book is good or not. And they are also very name conscious. So they're like, they're used to picking up books from big publishers. So the deal I did, and it could be a lesson for a lot of you out there is I got the big, I made much more money in China than I did in the U S on the sale of these books. But what I did, uh, was I'd get the publishing deal in the U S but I would keep the overseas rights. So all the over, because if you don't keep the overseas rights, you can't get, you get a tiny fraction because they go to a sub agent and this, everybody takes a share. And by the time you get it, it's a little bit, I negotiated directly with the Chinese publishers, got a huge advance against royalties. And then they put it and then the book just went everywhere. So that's my strategic advice. I love it. I, I was pretty much always going the self-publishing route because of, I was only answering one question was, do you, do I think they'll do a better marketing job than I will? And I, I was basically saying, no, they but didn't yeah, they won't. really yeah. think I wasn't thinking of the other areas that it might be beneficial. So and it's at least exploring down the other routes. And one of the things just to have a book is just to have a book. And I want to give some value back. And it's been really fun going through all these old podcasts and taking all these snippets out of these really interesting things that people have said. So it's been a fun I hope process. Make it in your book. I hope <laughs> <laughs> Squeeze me in. <laughs> a, 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 absolutely, absolutely. See, that's the reason why it's good that I'm not done yet. So that, that way we can get you in there. We've been holding out, is what we've been doing. <laughs> and in the absence of time. So I love that, by the way. Thank you so much. That's very helpful for me. The next thing that I always get excited about, and we've already talked a lot about, but I always like to start out if there's so many people, especially here, I'm in Austin, Texas, that want to do a startup. They want to get involved in a startup. They want to do their own startup. You know. What and, and there's so many ways to go about it. Find a co-founder, do this, do that. What's a great way to just get, get somebody started to go? Say they have an idea or whatever it might be. What's some tips and tricks to get involved into a startup? Okay, first of all, if you want to be an entrepreneur, just do it. Dive headfirst into it. Uh, don't worry about breaking your skull. It'll probably happen anyway. So you know this is that. There's no other way. I, I say just do it. But make sure two things: you have enough money in the bank to go for a year because it's not going to happen overnight. And you make sure you have an idea you can fund. You can get to the point where you can show that there is demand for your product, like that extreme demand. If you can't show that to invest, it's really tough to raise money. If you can, it's really easy. If you don't want to do that, and a lot of people don't want to take that risk, they have family, they have debts, they just don't be in security, join a startup. And how do you join a startup? I'll tell you how I found all my best employees. They were out there. 
they're at the networking events, they're meeting people, they're engaging, they're, do, you know, they're, they have the feet on the ground and COVID's almost hopefully over. We keep getting all these false signals. Hopefully you can go out and network with a lot of people, meet face to face. Nothing beats that. Go where entrepreneurs, go to the networking events where entrepreneurs go, meet them, talk to them, be enthusiastic, follow up, learn about their products. You will probably get a job. And then another area that you probably know a lot about because you are a venture investor, what has, and you already gave a big piece about getting funding, but any, any other kind of advice about startups that are wanting to get funding? Been through it all. Yeah, Been through sure. it all. So let's go back to the company Spider Dance that I started and got the deal with MTV. And I'll tell you a story, probably our last story since we're out of time. But in Spider Dance, I spent over a year trying to raise my first venture capital. Brutal experience. I didn't know any VCs. I was the early days. I didn't have those connections. I, the first thing I did is I would bring on investors and I'd be super nice to them. I would just be like giving them everything they want, always following up with them, always calling them back, trying to get, the, keep them on board. And they would just wait. They wouldn't invest. Finally, I got this one investor who was serious. They were this big new venture firm, well-funded out of Los Angeles with all these big heads of NBC Universal, all these big Hollywood execs. Michael Milken was on the board, like big names. So they brought us in. They were like, okay, we're going to fund you. We're going to give you $5 million. You got this deal with MTV. Awesome. Like we're going to do this. We spent 60K of our own money, which is a lot of money. We had raised 360K, ran up those debts for legal to negotiate the contract, had the contract all done. And we came to them and said, okay, we're, our product's going to launch in six weeks. Give us the money. And we need it because the product's launching and we need to have the money now. And we're almost out of money. And you know what they said? After all that, they told us, let's wait until it launches. Let's wait six uh, weeks and see. <laughs> yeah, you're like, yeah, yeah. And, and let's see if it's successful. And we're like, but you said we, we put a, and we're like, they're like, we want to wait. They, we, they knew we didn't have anybody else on the line. So we are like, okay, we'll wait. <laughs> so we waited six weeks and we were furiously working on this product. Like it was like brutal. MTV kept calling us up. It was the early days of the internet. And they're like, television doesn't go down. Your product cannot crash. Yes, we don't, we don't know how many users will join, but it could be a lot of users. They were on TV nonstop, like literally putting ads on there for Web Riot, They're the big new show. And we had no way, we had no Amazon hosting, no way to scale this. We had put it up in a co-location facility, the hardware ourselves, everything done ourselves, had a T1 line in there, really had no idea to, how to load test it, nothing. So we were like, yeah, it'll work. <laughs> we <didn't know. laughs> and the day comes, we have everything hanging on the line, not just our deal with MTV, but our funding, everything that's on the line. We launched the product. Users start to flood in like crazy because it was they were putting it on air for just so many weeks ahead of time. All of a sudden, our servers go down. Yeah. Ah, shit. Then the phone rings. It's a senior vice president of MTV, and he is cursing me out. What the blank is going on? You told you the television doesn't go down. <laughs> no, we need money for servers. And I go, hold on. Let me call my engineers. We'd, and I call my engineers and I'm like, what's going on? Why is it down? And they're like scrambling around going crazy. They're like, somebody is doing a denial of service attack on us. They are hacked us. And this was the early days. They didn't have the firewalls and all the stuff. So they were like, we're trying to block the IP addresses manually. Like, <laughs> and, and a few minutes later, the servers go back up. They actually did it. They blocked the hack. And we, the show ran flawlessly. And the show after that ran flawlessly. And I go back to the investors and I was like, we did it. And the show was a huge hit. Give us the money. And they go, okay, we'll give you the money now. But you know what? We thought about it and we want to give it to you at half the valuation we promised. What? <laughs> You made us wait. We launched. It was more successful than we expected. And you want to give us half the valuation? They don't call them vulture capitalists for nothing. All, all, all the leverage on you. Hollywood deal guys, and they will squeeze you. Like, so they were squeezing us. And we had a choice. Like, we could either walk off a cliff 
walk away from them with no money and not even enough to keep our servers running, let alone pay people or do the deal. And we were like, do we really want to be in bed with these guys, these evil people that would do this to us? Do we want them as our partners? And we said, no, screw you. We're walking. So we felt really good. We walked out the door, said, we don't need your money. And it felt great until we were out the door. <laughs> then we were devastated. We had no money. It was literally right before Christmas. All of Silicon Valley shuts down between Christmas and mid-January. And when people get back from CES and we, it was horrible and we were so depressed and it was so down and so hard. And I learned the first lesson here. The first lesson was we should have walked when they said that they uh, wanted to wait six weeks. You'd never let an investor wait. You give them a deadline and no matter how much you need the money, you walk. And then we should have been scrambling. For, we should have had other investors on the line. We were talking to just them and they knew it and they knew how much we needed the money. We made two mistakes. We showed them we needed the money and just one investor. Don't make these mistakes. And if they're going to change the deal, then what is not They're probably going to change the deal again. Exactly. So that was the first red flag that we just walked right over. And so we learned the hard way. You don't do these things. And no matter how good an investor seems, always walk away if they're not willing to commit. Give them a deadline. You have to set the deadline. You can't let them set it. And if they aren't willing to commit, go, because you haven't lost anything. In fact, you're saving yourself a lot of grief. So we were out in the cold. We, we went to CES again in the new year, but we had no money, but we had already bought the tickets and everything. And we stayed in this cheapest, sleaziest hotel in Vegas you could imagine. It was so depressing. We couldn't even get out of bed to hardly go to the show. Like we were so depressed, but I didn't give up. I actually kept looking for investors, although none of them were biting. I found that there was this company called Macro Media, and they are now Adobe. So they're Adobe today. But they had just, were just about to launch Flash. It was their new product. And the president said to me, when I met with him, he said, look, can you get this working with Flash? And if you can, we're interested. I was like, absolutely, no problem. I didn't know if we could, but we, we, we're going to do this. Flash, it, we, we consider it done. And then he goes, can, and then he goes, oh, but we can't invest ourselves, we have to follow a, a top tier VC firm. That's our policy. So I was like, oh, <laughs> finally got somebody interested and they can't even invest. He goes, when everybody comes back, I'll introduce you. So we're waiting, begged our employees to work for free, you know, hosting provider, delaying payments, doing whatever we can to just stay afloat at this point. And we get introduced. He brings us in, like he said, mid-January to one of the top of VC firms on Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley. I go into this firm and he joins me for the meeting, the president of this big company. And I'm like, why is, I thought, great. But I also thought, why is he wasting his time like doing this joint? And I figured it out. He wanted to see if, what the investor said firsthand. And if the investor poo-pooed the deal, shot the deal down, he wasn't going to introduce me to anybody else <laughs> because he would see all the flaws. And if the investor was excited, uh, but didn't invest, but was still excited, then he probably would introduce me to other people. So he was there to see. And so he's sitting and I knew everything hinged on this pitch, this one pitch, right? If it fails, he's not getting, nothing's going to happen. So I give it my all talk about how great we're doing with MTV. Did not mention that we're running on fumes. Don't do that. I learned my lesson. If they would have asked me, I would have told them, but I usually don't ask. So I just, just talk about the good stuff and went through the pitch. And when I'm done, I look at the investor and he is stone faced, like no expression whatsoever. And he goes, excuse me, and gets up and walks out of the room. <laughs> I turn like the, the president of the, the company and I look at him and he looks at me. We don't know what's going on. And sitting there, he comes back in a few minutes later, sets down a sheet of paper and he goes, I don't want to give you $5 million like you asked for. I want to give you $7 million. I'm like, what? Wow. <laughs> like, I would love $7 million <laughs> Like after, <laughs> after being in the situation we're in. And, but I didn't say that. <laughs> I, kept <my laughs> poker, I kept my poker face on. I was like, oh, seven, seven million. He goes, yeah, we want to sign the deal right now. Here's your term sheet. I was like, why? I like spent a year trying to get investors to give me a term sheet, like after dozens of meetings with them and they never did. And here's a guy who wants to sign today, like on my first pitch. It's like, how did this happen? So I'm thinking real quickly during the meeting. I was like, oh, 
it happened because I mentioned to him that they were the first venture capital firm that this company, Macromedia, now Adobe, is introducing us to. Right. And there's the president sitting in the room. Yeah. <laughs> so he knows it's true. He didn't want to let me leave the room. He wants to be also married to them too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. He, so basically I said, I wanted to, I wanted, what I needed more than the money was I needed the money yesterday. <laughs> And these deals can take a while to close. Lawyers, they're busy, they're out. They're, it's amazing trying to get these lawyers to, to do these deals. It can drag on for months sometimes so because the lawyers are just slow. It's not their priority. So I, was, I turned to him and I said, no, we don't need, I didn't ask for seven. I only asked for five at this valuation. But I'll tell you what, I will split the difference with you. I will take six on one condition that you can close this deal in two weeks, which is a super aggressive time frame. Mm -hmm, he looked mm -hmm. at me and he said, done deal. Wow. So literally, we, he did it. He lived up to his word. The deal was closed in two weeks. The money was in the bank and we had done it. And that's my lesson about investing. Investing, this is, I'll leave your audience with this one thing uh, before we wrap up. Investing, to get an investor to commit, you have to get their fear of losing the deal more greater than their fear of losing their money. If they are more afraid of losing the deal than their money, they will write you the check. That's the key. Wow, wow, and that's, that's really thinking on their terms. So I have one last question I end every podcast with this, is how would you like to be remembered? Ah, you mean on my gravestone? <laughs> However you wanna take it. So I would be like, I like to be remembered as the passionate guy who, who just, does what he feels is best regardless. So, you know, that expression, follow your passion, that's what I try to live by. I love it. Well, Steve, it was a huge pleasure and honor to have you on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. And if your audience wants to reach me for any reason, uh, they can go to founderspace.com, founderspace, and you can contact me there. My books are there. Lots of videos, fun stuff, lots of free educational stuff for entrepreneurs, or they can reach out to me on LinkedIn. So I'm always on LinkedIn. Absolutely. And we always put all the different links on our uh, website, establishingempire.com, plus in the show notes. And we'll make sure that what you, I'm excited about, I haven't read the uh, Make Elephants Fly book yet, but I'm excited about that one. Just because of the title, and I know that I already ended my podcast with the, my last question, but how did you come up with that name? Ah, make elephants fly. Yeah, I love that title too. So the elephant is your big idea. And it seems impossible to make an elephant fly. How do you make an elephant fly? So the book is all about how to make your take, get your big idea off the ground. Love it. Uh, I, thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers.